In 1954, shrimp was expected to explode with a force of about five megatons, but the calculations were wrong. Winds spread radioactive fallout much further than expected. We had not been prepared to have that such a high yield, so the fallout area was much larger. And then fortunately, there was a Japanese fishing vessel, I think called the Lucky Dragon, where some of this fallout came down on them. And uh, they had no information as to what this was. They were a long ways away. And before any information got to them or they were detected, some of the people did suffer some uh, radiation effects. The fishermen had been over 80 miles away when they were caught in a cloud of radioactive dust. Once again, the Japanese have been poisoned by ashes of death, reported one Tokyo newspaper. All 23 crewmen fell ill. One died. I thought it was unfortunate that human beings had been affected, but uh, people get hurt in all sorts of things all the time. Uh, I don't see why the public reaction was quite so strong, although the media has a tremendous effect on the public reaction. But it wasn't just the media. A former Los Alamos scientist was worried too. I came to the conclusion that the bomb was a very dirty bomb. And then came a statement from the uh, Atomic Energy Commission in the United States to say, don't worry about this, this fallout. It's no more than you get from a, from a chest X-ray. Now, I happen to know how much you get from a chest X-ray, and I became very much alarmed. Several of the world's leading scientists shared this concern. With British philosopher Bertrand Russell, they put their names to a manifesto. There lies before us, if we choose, continual progress in happiness, knowledge, and wisdom. Shall we instead choose death? Because we cannot forget our quarrels. We appeal as human beings to human beings. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. If you can do so, the way lies open to a new paradise. If you cannot, there lies before you the risk of universal death. In 1955, Russia dropped the world's first airborne H-bomb. shells to crawl into like Bert the turtle, so we have to cover up in our own way. First, you duck, and then you cover. And very tightly, you cover the back of your neck. We would get under our desks and stay there until we were told to come out. Or in some cases, in some of the classrooms, we had coat rooms off to the side of each classroom. And we'd walk through, and we'd get our coat, and we'd go out into the hallways, and we would literally ducked down facing against the wall. Remember what to do, friends. Now tell me right out loud. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? In that way, we thought we were protecting ourselves from the bombs and from any damage that would be, would be done to us. We felt totally secure and protected. Bomb shelters, you know, building bomb shelters in the backyard. It was certainly something you saw a lot in magazines and, and this connotation that this was happening somewhere in suburbia, USA. I do remember thinking of places in our homes where these enemy people, these Russians, would never ever find us and we would again be, of course, very safe forever. <laughs> in the 1950s, it didn't even cross our minds that the Americans were frightened of a Soviet invasion. 
We thought they knew we only had peaceful aims, that all we wanted was to live in peace. We wanted to rebuild our country. We had our five-year plans. Nowhere was it written that we wanted to invade anybody. We thought that we had something to be frightened of, because they were capitalists, and that was something terrible for us. We believed that they sucked the blood of the workers. It didn't even cross our minds that the Americans were scared of us. It didn't even cross our minds that the Americans were scared of us. In the summer of 1955, the major powers convened in Geneva. The Russian delegation was led by Marshal Bulganin and Nikita Khrushchev. Eisenhower's most striking proposal was open skies. Ike claimed his plan would ease mutual suspicion, but it would also prize open the secrecy of the Soviet military machine. Open skies involve both the freedom to overfly each other and observe, photograph and observe what was happening, and second, an exchange of blueprints, as uh, Eisenhower termed it, of uh, the military programs on both sides. We broke up for tea shortly after that, and as we were standing there, Khrushchev uh, came walking up to Eisenhower, sidling up uh, uh, in his way of walking, and said, Nyet, 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 you're simply trying to look into our bedrooms. And as we were riding back, Eisenhower said, Now we know who's in charge of the Soviet delegation. Later that year at the Moscow Air Show, the Soviets allowed the West to see their new jet bombers, codenamed Bison. Significantly, overhead flew 10 long-range Tu-95s, capable of delivering a nuclear bomb all the way to America. For the Americans, seeing 10 planes capable of reaching the United States was a shock. At that time, in the absence of ballistic missiles, they supposed that the Soviet Union didn't have any means of delivery to America. In response to fears of a bomber gap, Ike doubled the rate of B-52 bomber production. America needed to find out how much of a gap there really was. In California, the raps were coming off a secret photographic reconnaissance plane. It was designed to fly at 70,000 feet, out of range of fighter planes and anti-aircraft missiles. The U-2. Controlled by the CIA, these long flights across Soviet territory posed obvious risks. But the information they might bring would be vital. Ike took the gamble. One of the flights I was on, uh, I came across the Engels, Saratov Engels airfield. And much to my surprise and joy, it was loaded with bison bombers. I knew right then that I had found that there was a bomber gap, that, that I, this had to be the most important picture ever taken by a reconnaissance pilot. I just, you know, I kind of expected uh, Congressional Medals of Honors when I landed. Uh, however, it turned out that what I'd taken a picture of was not just a portion of the entire Russian Air Force bomber fleet. Uh, 
but in fact, I'd taken a picture of the entire Russian bomber fleet, and there really was no bomber gap. They were all on that airfield at the same time. Khrushchev, uh, around that period, uh, came to the conclusion that missiles uh, were the weapons of the future, and that uh, warships were getting obsolete, bombers were getting obsolete, that we should concentrate everything on, uh, um, uh, on missiles. And as he said somewhere, uh, that we are on the point of producing missiles like sausages. Engineers from all over the Soviet Union had been arriving in the harsh Kazakhstan desert to build the top secret rocket base of Baikonur. On the 15th of May, 1957, they began testing the world's first intercontinental ballistic